Hi, welcome to the 2013 Spring Edition of Cycle 360, which is Cycle's online news resource that aims to keep you up to date on topics likely of interest to Cycle members. We have a very exciting lineup for you in this edition, which revolves around the many fun and educational events, activities, and resources available at this year's 2013 AACC Annual Meeting. To start us off, Dr. Deborah French will be highlighting several sessions and events at this year's annual meeting in Houston that may be of interest to cycle members. She will also describe how use of the AACC's Pathfinder app can be a helpful tool in planning your schedule and navigating the annual meeting. So as you are reviewing the program to plan your schedule, take advantage of this useful summary. Next, hear insight about the upcoming Clinical Chemistry and Clinical Biochemistry Reviewers Workshop to be held at this year's annual meeting in an interview with Dr. Pete Kavsak conducted by Dr. Joe L. Curry. Dr. Kavsak is the Editor-in-Chief for the Clinical Biochemistry Journal. In this interview, he discusses how the Reviewers Workshop will provide you with tips for performing peer review, how cycle member involvement in peer review can benefit you, and the value cycle members add to the peer review process. So don't miss out on this great interview. Next, do you ever wonder what resources experts in the field of clinical chemistry have found useful in their work experiences? Make sure to check out this section of the podcast to learn which books your colleagues recommend to cycle members to survive on call. And take the opportunity to preview and potentially buy these books at the AACC bookstore that will be on site at the AACC annual meeting in Houston. Lastly, hear insight from Bill Malone, a senior editor and writer for the Clinical Laboratory and News Magazine, as he reveals to Psycho members their cumulative response to the latest Cycle 360 Fun Fact Survey question, which asked, which apps and social media do you use to receive updates and ne network with AACC members? Additionally, Listen to Bill share his thoughts about why laboratorians and healthcare professionals should take interest in AACC's social media channels, as well as how you can use AACC's social media at the annual meeting. On behalf of the Cycle Committee and the Cycle 360 Subcommittee, we would like to thank the many individuals whom contributed to this podcast edition, and thank all of you for watching and contributing to the success of the Cycle 360 podcast your online cycle news resource. We hope that you enjoy this edition. Today we would like to take some time to let cycle members know about sessions and events at the 2013 AACC annual meeting in Houston that might be of interest. As we are living in a budget conscious world it is important to note that there are a number of sessions that are included in the registration fee for the annual meeting. These include the plenary sessions, featuring nationally recognized leaders from clinical practice, research, business and policy that take place every day of the meeting. The Meet the Expert sessions after the plenary sessions on Monday through Wednesday provide you with an opportunity to join a small group of interested colleagues for discussions with the plenary speakers and other invited experts. The symposia sessions consist of lectures given by experts actively involved in the field and occur in the morning and afternoon. The poster sessions are also an excellent way of interacting with colleagues in a more informal setting where you can find out what new and exciting research is being carried out in the clinical chemistry field. And don't miss the opening mixer after the plenary session on Sunday. Grab a drink, catch up with old friends and make some new ones. This year's cycle workshop is on Saturday, July 27th and is entitled Practical Approaches to Sustainable Planning and Achieving Lean Success. The afternoon is broken into two main parts. The first part is How Can My Lab Achieve Lean Success? And this session includes presentations from James Peters from Leap Technologies and Dr. Thomas Burgess from Quest Diagnostics and also a breakout session led by James Peters. The second part is Practical Approaches to Sustainable Planning in the Clinical Lab and in My Career. And this session includes presentations from Drs. Anne Granowski, Nader Rafai, Paul Ginetto and Carmen Wiley. And after all the important science stuff is finished with, it is time for a more relaxed social gathering in the form of the cycle reception. As you can see from these pictures, everyone had a great time at the 2012 cycle mixer. 
As mentioned by Dr. Alan Wu in our previous podcast, the Biomarkers of Acute Cardiovascular Diseases Division will be hosting a forum on Saturday, July 27th. The topic of this forum is the applications of high sensitivity troponin in clinical practice, and it will be followed by a reception. You can sign up for this forum under the special events section of your annual meeting registration form. On Monday morning, there is a great opportunity for cycle members to learn from leading experts on how to perform scientific peer reviews. Dr. Tom Ansley and Dr. Peter Kavsak will be giving us some guidance, and this you don't want to miss. Please listen to Joe's podcast section for more details regarding this workshop. On Monday afternoon, don't forget to support your fellow cycle members by attending the Student Oral Presentation Contest and the Student Poster Contest at the Convention Centre. And attend the Joint ABCC Cycle Reception at 5.30pm on Monday evening to congratulate the cycle members who won travel awards, who became diplomates, and also the winners of the Cycle Service and Mentorship Awards. There are a number of sessions both included in the registration fee and those that require an extra fee to attend that may be of interest to cycle members. These include sessions on method performance evaluation, endocrinology, lab management and mass spectrometry. If the session begins with a 3, that means it is included in the registration fee. The other sessions are either short courses or roundtable sessions that take place throughout the meeting or AACC University sessions that take place on Sunday. Some more sessions that may be of interest to cycle members are those that cover topics in genomics, biomarkers, toxicology and therapeutic drug monitoring and point of care testing. A great way of interacting with colleagues in a small group discussion format is to attend a roundtable session. Each roundtable is given twice once at 7.30 a.m. and again at 12.30 p.m. and it costs $25 to attend. This year a number of great topics will be discussed at these roundtables by cycle members including moving averages QC monitoring, pain management, getting your first job and the limitations of HCG point of care testing along with many other excellent topics listed here. So grab your breakfast or your lunch and support your fellow cycle members by participating in a roundtable session. A great way to give back to our profession is to attend the Van Slyke Foundation silent auction and reception. This will be held on Wednesday evening at the Hotel Icon and costs $75 per person. The great thing about this evening is that every dollar raised from ticket sales and auction sales goes directly to the people who need it, whether it be laboratorians from emerging areas, young investigators or science students. The Van Slyke Foundation sponsors scholarships, travel grants, research awards and science fair prizes. And to top it all, it is a lot of fun. So sign up for the VSF silent auction and reception under the special events section on the annual meeting registration form. As we all know, the AACC annual meeting is packed full of sessions that we would like to attend. A really useful tool for helping to plan your schedule is the AACC Pathfinder app that is freely available online and soon to be available on Apple or Android devices. In this app you can search the sessions by event type, keyword or speaker name to find sessions that you are interested in attending. You can then add these sessions to your AACC Pathfinder calendar if you register to use this app so that your schedule is available to you on the go. Another useful feature of the app is that it contains a list of exhibitors and a floor plan of the exhibition floor to make sure that you don't get lost. Listen to the fun fact section of this podcast to learn more about Pathfinder from Bill Malone, the Senior Editor of Clinical Laboratory News. Today we have given you a quick overview of the sessions that may be of interest to cycle members at the 2013 AACC Annual Meeting in this section of this podcast. For more information about the conference program, you can go to the link on the AECC website. See you all in Houston. Hi. Peer reviewing is an essential part of the scientific publishing process. As reported by Dr. Thomas Annesley in his clinical chemistry publication, seven reasons not to be a peer reviewer and why these reasons are wrong. He says, 
Peer reviewers play a key role in contributing to the quality, the value, and even the reputation of science. With me today to talk about an exciting new opportunity for cycle members is Dr. Pete Kafsak, Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster University in Ontario, Canada, and Editor-in-Chief of Clinical Biochemistry. Hi, Dr. Kafsak. Hi there. Can you please tell us more about this exciting opportunity that will be available to the cycle members at the AACC annual meeting in Houston, Texas this year? Yes, Joe. I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity on this uh, joint workshop uh, with uh, clinical chemistry and clinical biochemistry. And uh, the purpose of this is to kind of take the uh, veil off of peer reviewing, um, kind of highlight um, what is important, what do journal editors wish to see in the review, and really encourage those who are sitting on the fence or are kind of anxious to do peer review, uh, give them a little feel and maybe a, a tool set that they can start to tackle uh, articles for that to get directed their way. Excellent. And so what would the time slot be for that session at the meeting? Uh, it's early morning. Um, it's early Monday morning, and it's in the program. Uh, I believe it's 7 till uh, 8.30, and uh, there'll be, I believe, a continental breakfast. But uh, bright and early, but we'll be able to get everyone when they're awake and ready to hear uh, about the setting of opportunities there is for peer review and prior to the start of the conference. Excellent. And just as a reminder, they do have to send you an email, right, to reserve their spot. Yes, um, it is actually uh, be very much appreciated, and if not, we'll hound the individuals to actually send in their confirmation that they wish to uh, participate. An email is also something that would be required. And uh, to be honest with you, why I need that is that I'd like to put these people in, in at least a system for clinical biochemistry. So we need that information. And uh, after this uh, introductory um, workshop, I think that uh, people will start to feel comfortable and will gain access to, uh, at least for clinical biochemistry, uh, being part of the reviewer pool, which is, again, it's exciting opportunities for sure. Excellent. And so I know one reason why some cycle members, fellows in particular, might feel reluctant to become peer reviewers is because they don't consider themselves experts in their field or qualified to do a peer review. But your workshop specifically targets recruiting this audience. So what value do cycle members add to the peer review process of your journal? I mean, I did read uh, Dr. Uh, Tom's and Leslie's uh, publication, Clinical Chemistry, and he nailed it on, uh, nail on the head uh, when he mentioned that, typically speaking, uh, individuals who are just recently completed the training program or in the training program, they may be one of the best people to do the peer review for a lot of certain aspects. Um, you know, you're at the top of your game for a lot of uh, um, areas in, in clinical chemistry. Um, you have the energy, you have the desire, and um, those are key things that will actually succeed in doing a, a proper peer review. Not only do we need the scientific aspect to it to be appropriate, and uh, those that are in training programs who have just finished realize their, their limitations, but also can actually detail what their limitations are and we'll be able to convey that back to the editors. And so uh, this is exactly the type of group that we want uh, to engage and uh, hopefully uh, individuals that do turn up to the workshop do feel empowered to, um, you know, accept the next assignment that comes their way in regards to peer review. For members who are interested in becoming more involved in scientific journals by joining editorial boards to becoming editors-in-chief such as yourself, what advice do you offer these members from your personal experience? Um, a couple of things. I think the thing is, is that uh, you would be surprised how often good peer reviews that are performed by individuals get noticed by the editorial, the handling editors, the associate editors, editors-in-chief. Um, We'll use them many, many times over. And such fact that sometimes individuals who've done such a great job in peer reviewing, um, sometimes will get invited to sit on that editorial board. That's one route. Other routes are experts in their fields and so forth. So in order to further, um, you know, perhaps those individuals who wish to get involved in the, the uh, you know, on the editorial aspect of things, again, 
publishing is one aspect for sure. Um, you know, do as much as you can in that regard. But a second very important component is the peer review process. And uh, you have to have both of those things, you know, going in, in, before you can think about, um, you know, making a significant contribution. That is great advice. Dr. Kafsak, thank you very much, and I look forward to being there in the early morning session to teach us how to become peer reviewers. Thank you very much for all your help and advice, and I look forward to seeing you at the meeting. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Do you ever wonder what resources experts in the field of clinical chemistry have found useful in their work experience? To find out, we asked experts, what books do you rely on to survive on call? Today we will highlight several of the books recommended by your colleagues that would make great additions to your bookshelf. Before we discuss the insightful recommendations, we thought that this is a great time to remind you of the valuable and wide offerings of books available at the AACC store, including the books recommended today. In addition to the usual online store found on the AACC website, there is a bookstore on site at the AACC annual meeting. This is a great opportunity to get your hands on the books and preview them before you buy. Leave room in your luggage and bring a few home with you. Our first recommended book is the Teats Textbook of Clinical Chemistry and Molecular Diagnostics, or as Paul Ginetto put it, the Bible of our field. The Teats Textbook was also recommended by Dr. Sean Clinton and Jim Nichols. Dr. Nichols describes the Teats textbook as a great reference for lab directors, technologists, and students alike. It covers a wide range of topics so well, its grand size may make it best to buy online to leave room in your luggage for your return trip. On the slightly lighter side, literally, Dr. Larry Broussard recommends the Teats Clinical Guide to Laboratory Tests, as it's a good resource for quickly referencing information on tests and reference intervals and is especially useful for pharmacokinetic values for therapeutic drugs. The next recommended reference is commonly referred to as the White Book. If you hear this name, people are referring to contemporary practice in clinical chemistry. Doctors Paul Ginetto and Veronica Luzzi both endorse this book as a board exam study guide and it can remain on your bookshelf as a helpful reference for general chemistry well beyond the exam. Our last general chemistry reference is small enough to fit into your coat pocket. As Dr. Carmen Wiley attests, Baker's ABCs of Interpretive Laboratory Data is detailed in its explanation of each, each test, including graphics and differential diagnoses. It's fast and easy to find what you need. For those wanting to brush up on their toxicology knowledge, Dr. Paul Ginetto offers up the Clinical Toxicology Laboratory book from AACC Press. This book is a concise reference to have on hand for answering questions about common toxicology agents. For those of us who need to brush up on our blood gases and acid base knowledge, Dr. Mark Servinsky suggests the Blood Gases and Electrolytes book. This book is sure to give you many of the details you need to understand this intricate topic. Dr. James Nichols also recommends to us the Effect series of reference books. These books include four series, each that summarize the effects of preanalytical variables, diseases, drugs, or herbs on laboratory tests. Each entry is supported by a reference to a published study, so you can delve more deeply into any particular one. As I often have had discussions with technologists in my lab and colleagues about this topic, I'm adding my favorite book for pediatric reference intervals. The Pediatric Reference Intervals book is in its seventh edition, being updated with the most current studies as they are published. This is a great guide no matter the size of your pediatric population. These recommended books, as well as many, many more, can be found in the AACC store on the AACC website. A wide selection will also be available at the AACC bookstore on site at the AACC annual meeting. Make sure to check it out and be ready for surviving your next on call, knowing that you have these books available on your bookshelf for reference. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in Houston. Hi, welcome back to the Cycle 360 Fun Fact Series. Today we are in for a delightful treat as we have a special guest joining us, Bill Malone 
whom you likely know for his active contributions to the field of clinical chemistry as a senior editor and writer for Clinical Laboratory News. Bill wears multiple hats as he also currently serves as the team leader of AACC's social media initiative. If you recall, our most recent Cycle 360 Fun Facts survey question was related to the cycle members' utilization of AACC's social media. So we are very pleased that Bill has generously accepted our invite to share with all of you the cycle members' cumulative responses to the Fun Fact question, as well as share his insight about why laboratories and healthcare professionals should take interest in AACC's social media resources. So welcome, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the introduction, Nicole. Glad to be here. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit today about social media at AACC and let cycle members know about what their organization is doing right now, how they can be a part of it, and also talk a little bit about why social media may be worth your time as scientists and healthcare professionals. First, the results of the recent Cycle Fun Facts survey. So the survey asked about which apps and social media cycle members use to receive updates and network with other members. The results were actually pretty surprising. Nearly 45% of respondents said they didn't use Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or any other social media this way. Among those who said they do use these, use these social media channels, the most popular were the AACC Facebook page and the AACC LinkedIn group at 17% and 35% respectively. Now, there may be any number of reasons that those who responded to the survey have not yet been very active on social media. I think one reason might be that AACC needs to build more awareness of our social media channels. Another could be that cycle members themselves don't feel that they have the time or don't see a great benefit in using social media. I'll talk about that second reason later, but first, I'd like to offer a broad view of what AACC is doing with social media right now. AACC is active on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and of course, podcasts like this one. Under the AACC umbrella, we also have Twitter and Facebook from our journal, Clinical Chemistry, from our news magazine, Clinical Laboratory News, and for our lab tests online website. All of these channels are ways AACC is communicating with members and other stakeholders, sharing news about events like webinars or the AACC annual meeting and clinical lab expo, or highlighting news stories from CLN and other sources. Clinical chemistry is also known for its podcasts, which have become very popular. The main AACC Facebook page recently reached 4,000 likes which means that posts on this page can reach at least 4,000 people's Facebook pages, and even more when a person shares one of our stories with their friends. The Clinical Chemistry Journal Facebook page has even more, nearly 6,000 likes. This page shares direct links to articles, podcasts, as well as photos and other unique content not found on the Clinical Chemistry website. The Lab Tests Online Facebook page is growing as well, and it's a particularly good use of Facebook since we can reach many consumers on social media who may not know much about laboratory testing. As we've all heard, many consumers now turn to the Internet for information about health before they even talk to their doctor. AACC is also on Twitter, where the main AACC Twitter feed has nearly 2,000 followers. A micro-blogging site, Twitter is a quick way to communicate with diverse stakeholders, and our numbers have grown rapidly over the past few years. Clinical Chemistry, Lab Tests Online, and Clinical Laboratory News are also on Twitter. The CLN Twitter feed is one I'm actively posting on as a senior editor and writer for the magazine. And we try to pull together news for our Twitter feed both from AACC publications and from around the web. Also on Twitter, AACC's ClinLab Job Center, which is brand new. It's another way for those looking for jobs to keep track of new jobs that are posted. Each tweet has a direct link to the job post on the ClinLab Job Center. LinkedIn has been very popular in the academic and scientific community, 
and AACC's LinkedIn group is no exception. We now have more than 5,000 people in our group. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the value and culture, if you will, of social media and why I recommend Cycle members get more familiar with it. Of course, we want you to follow AACC on social media, but there are lots of other reasons too. First off, I think there are a few unique properties of social media that are worth pointing out. In other words, what makes social media social? Different from traditional media like letters, television, books, radio, magazines, or even email. Some of these points may be obvious, but when we're so saturated in so many different media, I think they're worth emphasizing. One is visibil visibility. On social media, although some channels like Facebook allow you to set limits on who could see what, more often than not, you become more visible. This can be scary, but it can also be incredibly valuable if you know how to follow boundaries while using social media and have a message to share, either a personal message or a professional one. Another is connectivity. In social media, relationships are unmoored from geography, time, and other variables. Messages move rapidly with almost no cost to the sender. This has some pretty incredible consequences for science, I think. For example, collaboration can be more rapid, more open, and more accessible to people in different parts of the world. Finally, transparency. Social media push people into a more connected, visible public sphere, and in doing so, are developing a culture that values transparency, creativity, and less formal and more direct interaction among people on a personal and professional level. Now, one reason we may not see as much activity from some AACC members on social media is simply due to age. Intense users of social media tend to be under 30, with about 83% of 18 to 29-year-olds using social media at the high end, and only about 32% of those over age 65 at the low end. This is according to 2012 data from the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project. However, use of social media is growing rapidly among all age groups. And, for example, more than half of those aged 50 to 64 used social media in 2012, compared to only 11% in 2008. Use of social media also varies by channel. For example, 67% of all Internet users in Pew's research used Facebook in 2012, compared to only 16% of all Internet users being on Twitter. So why do I think laboratorians should care? Well, a number of reasons. Networking is rather obvious. If more and more people connect with each other via social media, eventually you'll miss out if you're not joining those discussions. But I would also argue, and I have to qualify with this with the fact that I'm not a trained scientist but a writer, that some of the core values of science and healthcare are shared by the culture of social media. For example, the ethos of scientific research is about sharing ideas, learning from others, and being transparent with your sources, methods, and findings. In addition, professionals in science and healthcare often depend on personal connections and networking to advance their careers. This has always been the case. The difference is that now, in addition to face-to-face -face conferences or conversation at a cocktail party of coworkers, some of that networking is taking place online via these various social media channels. And using social media doesn't have to be a drain on your time if you learn to use it effectively and put some effort into managing your use of it. Finally, social media, I think, can be a way for the science-related professions, whether in healthcare or not, to bring their knowledge, views, and value to the fore of public thinking. This is especially important, I think, for an area like laboratory medicine, where many lay people simply don't have a basic appreciation of the incredible value laboratorians bring to healthcare. I want to read a quote here from Alan Alda. He said, if scientists could communicate more in their own voices, 
in a familiar tone and with less specialized vocabulary, would a wide range of people understand them better? Would their work be better understood by the general public, policymakers, funders, and even in some cases other scientists? Definitely something to think about. So I hope I've convinced you that if you're not already active on social media, it's worth it to at least consider taking the next step. For example, it only takes a few minutes to sign up for a Twitter account and start following AACC and other organizations and people. There are also some great in-depth resources out there specifically about science and social media that are on the slide deck for this presentation. Also, if you're a Twitter user, use the hashtag AACC2013 for your tweets about the annual meeting. Not only does it help put your tweets into context about the event, but the AACC Pathfinder app for smartphones and tablets will feature Twitter and other social media channels that carry discussions about the annual meeting. This AACC app will be available in the iTunes and Android app stores soon, so I encourage you to check it out. And certainly, if you're interested in social media and want to learn more, by all means, give me a call. I'd love to chat with you about how you can use social media or to hear feedback on how you think AACC is doing in our own efforts. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for updating us about AACC's social media resources and sharing your insight as to how using social media can be of value to clinical chemists and healthcare professionals. I just started a Twitter account, which, like you said, was very easy to do and took less than five minutes, and I must say that I'm quite surprised by all of the interesting information that one can learn by using social media. So thank you for encouraging me and all of CYCLE members uh, to take the next step with AACC's social media.